Okay, so here's our lecture on the evidence for evolution. In our first lecture, we were looking at the genes within populations and how those allele or gene frequencies can change, which is the basic foundation of evolution, change in the genetic frequencies of populations over time. So with that under our belt, we now want to look at how do we prove evolution? What are the lines of evidence that have been used and are still being used to support the evolutionary theory. Keep in mind, when we use the word theory in science, it is something that has support. It has lots and lots of support, multiple lines of evidence. There's a significant body of work that confirms these ideas. They're not guesses. They are not, we think, it's, it's supported. All the data suggests, supports, and confirms that you know what? This is what is happening. Okay, so our evidence is multiple lines of different things that help show us evolution occurs. So back when Charles Darwin was doing his journey of the Southern Hemisphere, he came across the Galapagos finches. And the Galapagos, Galapagos Islands are a group of islands off the western coast of South America, 100 plus miles away from shore. So there's not this constant flow of birds back and forth, back and forth on a daily or weekly or even yearly basis. But what we see on the Galapagos Islands, they're pretty much an isolated group of islands. We see a large diversity of these finches. There's the woodpecker finch, the ground finch, the cactus finch, the vegetarian tree finch, warbler finch, etc. There's actually 13 different species found out there. And what we see is that their variation in beak shape and beak size changes. This has been studied for decades. Rosemary Grant and her husband studied the change in the beak shape of the finches over the course of 20, 30, 40 years and they started to see correlations that the beak shape changes based upon whether it's a dry year or a wet year. Beaks got bigger during dry years because they needed stronger beaks to crack tougher, larger seeds. Wet years, beaks got smaller. Not the individual beak, but the average beak size in the population would get smaller in wet years because the seeds were smaller. So they've watched this ice oscillation, this shifting and changing of beak size and beak shape for decades, showing the genes in those populations are changing. So here's what we're seeing. You know, this oscillation over time. They started looking at it in the 70s and continued through the 80s, and they're still continuing to look at these beaks and look at how they change in regards to rainfall. So it's showing us frequencies and populations change. So keep in mind, these are not individual finches that their individual beak changed. It's the population, the population beaks, the average size each generation changed over the course of time. And finches reproduce very quickly. So in the course of 20, 30 years, you're able to watch a lot of generations of finches. So it's things like this that provide us with evidence of watching evolution and in action, seeing it happen in front of our eyes. So we will talk about a variety of different examples and then look at the various lines. So another example here are called the peppered moths. This is known as industrial melanism. So what happened here is Moths in England have a dark color or a light color based upon their genetics. So think about DNA, big A, little a alleles, etc. And J.W. Tutt noticed back in the 1890s, about 1896, there was this decline in the white morph of the moth. And people started wondering, well, what's going on? What's happening with these populations of moths? So 1950, Dr. Kettlewell started looking at moths and noticed correlations in dark environments, polluted environments, dirty environments, there was a higher frequency of dark moths. 
in cleaner environments, healthier environments, there was a higher frequency of light moths. So you look at the two images below, clean, good environment, the light colored moths, you can barely find them, this one right there, it's hard to see. The dark ones, they definitely stand out. So think about predation. A predator in a clean environment is going to go after this moth right here and kill it. That means those genes will decrease in frequency. Now if we went to a dark environment that was polluted, dirtier, different environmental conditions, we see the exact opposite. I'm a predator, I'm going to kill this moth because I can see it easiest. This one is camouflaged, it's blending in. It's the same genes, the same alleles that produce dark moths in this environment and this one. It just happens the environments are different, so different adaptations work better or worse in those environments. So Kettlewell started studying these moths and he started tracking the frequencies. And what he noticed, 1848, 5% of the moths were dark, 95% were light. At that time, England, Manchester was fairly clean. Now as industrial revolution rolled in, coal was being burned, fossil fuels were being used to power things, pollution was produced. Large amounts of pollution were produced, which changed the environmental conditions. The trees were starting to get covered with soot, that black, dirty, nasty stuff that comes from burning coal, and that changed the color of the tree bark. So over the course of close to 50 years, Kettlewell observed a huge swing in the frequency shift. So 98% of the moths were dark, 2% were light. Now there's still moths, there's still the same species, but the allele frequency shifted dramatically in less than 50 years because of the environmental influence. Now as we got into the 1900s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, environmental laws were enacted, anti-pollution, can we clean it up, can we do things where we're not producing as much as many emissions as those were enacted, the colors started to shift back towards the original because the environment was beginning was changing and becoming cleaner. Trees were lighter instead of these dark, soot, nasty, grime-covered trees. So the environment plays a huge role in determining what is considered adaptable, what is a fit or beneficial type of allele. So these, these things keep shifting. That shows the populations are changing. And that's the idea behind evolution here. Populations change over time. We've done this intentionally when we look at artificial selection. So think about dogs. If you guys have dogs, you're a dog owner, think about all the different breeds of dogs out there. Those are all descended from the ancestral wolf population. Now, how we domesticated dogs is still being discussed, debated, a lot of speculation. That may never be known. But they became domesticated. So it's estimated 10 to 12,000 years ago, dogs and humans started working cooperatively together. Domestication began, and selective breeding was beginning. Artificial selection was taking place. Humans were intentionally helping certain dogs reproduce, increasing their survival chances because there were certain traits they liked. So imagine being a Neolithic man or woman 10,000 years ago and you have five dogs in your, in your community and the biggest and the strongest dog is helping you when you're hunting. You're going to feed that dog more. You're going to take care of it more. The dog that is not a good hunting dog, you may not give it any food. You may not value that dog. You may even, if times are harsh, may even let that dog die, starve to death, or you might even kill it to eat it yourself in that type of situation. So humans were selecting for certain traits. And over thousands of years and thousands of generations, this is what produced all of the different breeds of dogs that we have today. Breeds are just variations of the same species. So whether it's a German Shepherd, it's a Rottweiler, it's a Basset Hound, it's a Chihuahua, it's a Shih Tzu, it's a Border Collie, whatever, they are all related 
and we have selectively created these variations we call breeds. They're all from the same ancestral stock. They're just variations that we've artificially selected for. So we have the ability to cause things to change. We're doing it intentionally. And with today's biotechnology, we're doing it in the span of a generation versus dozens of generations. Plants are no exception to this rule. Humans have artificially selected for plants the wild mustard. We've selected certain traits and bred certain individuals over generation after generation after generation to give us all these different varieties of plants. Cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, and kohlrabi. All of those are descended from the original wild mustard plant that we selectively bred and used artificial selection on to create specific variations, specific new species. So think about modern agriculture. Corn. Here's our modern corn. The ancestor to modern corn is this grain here called teosinte. That's the original version of corn. Pretty darn small, not able to feed a lot of people. But over the course of thousands of generations, humans have gone through agricultural selection. So we are selecting crops based upon ideal, oh, ideal traits. Now those traits are controlled by genes. So we like the bigger corn, we like the rounder kernel, we like it to grow in this environment or do this or do that. That's what we've been doing for thousands of years by selection. So you're a Neolith Neolithic farmer 10,000 years ago and you're growing corn and every year you harvest your corn, your teosinte, but then you have to save some seed to plant next year. So if you're smart, you save the biggest seeds because those give you the biggest plants, which give you the biggest ears. And year after year after year, as you do this, your corn gets bigger. You continue to selectively pick the largest individuals, the largest offspring, and you're driving what's known as directional selection. Now, where we're at today with modern corn is all biotechnology. Let's splice genes into it. Let's insert the gene from bacteria into that corn. Let's insert the gene from that into that corn. It's the same concept. It's just being done at the molecular level versus let's just breed and save certain individual offspring to use for the next generation. So these different lines of evidence, these different things that are being done are constantly showing populations change, populations evolve, not individuals populations change. So Darwin, Charles Darwin was the main, main person behind formulating the evolutionary theory that is supported by natural selection. So that was Darwin's claim to fame. So he, he kept this idea close. You know, he, he did his journey on the HMS Beagle, put these ideas together, kept it, kept it kind of close, talked to a few friends. And then in 1858, he gets a letter from this young scientist named Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace outlines the same basic concepts of natural selection. What was amazing about this is Wallace was 30 some years later, after Darwin did his beginning research in natural selection and evolution, Wallace never talked to Darwin about this idea. It's not like he picked Darwin's brain and pulled it together and said, I got it. He came up with this on his own and in a completely different part of the world. He was over in Malaysia studying beetles, looking at what's going on there, and coming up with this, you know, this, this exact same conclusion about natural selection. So again, 20 years, I'm sorry, 20 years after Darwin, Wallace is doing this. So Darwin, 1838, formulates this idea, holds it close to itself, talks to a few friends, but now, 20 years later, same exact concept. At that point, they went, this is something important. This has support. This has more validity to it than just one individual. Let's present this to the Linnaean Society and see where science goes from there. 